right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Flame, and it's Monday. It's time for Master Motivation, and I'm joined by my guest today, uh, the legend, Ricardo Laborio. <laughs> I don't know about legends, but come on. Master Flame, thank you for having me here. This is I'm, awesome. No, I I'm appreciate so happy it. to have you. Yeah. Oh, I'm very happy to be here, too. Well, well and, and joining us all the way from Oslo, Norway. Norway. It's 11 yeah. degrees out yeah. there, and it's uh, nine, 9 o'clock in the evening, right? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Well, it's thank, a beautiful, thank, beautiful city, though. It's beautiful here, though. The whole country is beautiful, but awesome. it's cold. It well, you, you've gotten to see you've gotten to see a lot of the world uh, in your career yeah. that we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, uh, just to remind everybody, Master Motivation started uh, just as a way to really bring a little bit more motivation and positivity to social media in general. And I mm. uh, have been very blessed to be surrounded by uh, lots of people that have inspired me and motivated over my many years, not only in the martial arts industry, but uh, professional wrestling, just in life in general. Mm. And uh, you know, Mr. Loborio uh, definitely touched my life in, in several different ways. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite stories to tell about you, uh, just talking about the, the kind of person that you were, when you came out to my school, this was back in 2010 or I don't know, 2011, and yeah. you came for training and we were going to do some certification. And, and I happened to love the hoodie that you were wearing. I said, man, I love that hoodie. That's so cool. <laughs> and you said, well, here and you took it off and you gave it to me <laughs> and i swear that I, I i i wore that until it had holes in it because i was just so proud to that, that you would take literally the clothes off your back oh, to give oh. to me so that's Dang. one of my most favorite stories about you and and then we walked into a um we walked into a fight at house of champions out here in california and and just the the eyes that were looking left and right they're like whispering that's Ricardo Laborio was here you know we went to a smoker fight it was it was super cool but uh we've shared some great times uh in, in training on the mat and uh you know at the super show of course um but you know I, I really love to just open this up and and let you kind of introduce yourself uh kind of tell us about some of your uh some of your beginnings um and, and I, I know you got a lot I know you got a no, lot of stories to tell I'm just so. not good at talking about myself let me tell you this right now I'm, I'm terrible on doing this but I'm, let's go. Let's go back to history of this thing. Let's do it. Well, no, before that, thank you for having me here. You know, uh, Mr. Flame, you know, Jason, like I, I always call it, you have, number one, such a beautiful family. Um, your family environment there, you welcome me so much. And not just in your school, but in your home itself. You know, I, I would never forget this. You and your wife and the kids, um, how kind you were to me. and. And how open you were for, for, for learning and, and and everything. This is was it's a special, Jason. This is when you call me for this, this is one of the first vivid memories that came to my mind of being, you know, being sharing the bread in your house and with your family and 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 how how smart, intuitive, how um, how much you know about the industry itself, you know, your love for the sport. Your love of pro wrestling, <laughs> uh -huh. your, your brother too, which is a completely into the fighting. Um, I, I just love him, man. I just have to say that, you know. Thank you, thank you for having me here. So many great names, so many people that that I also, you know, look up to it. That you interview, that is being part of your project, which is a beautiful project, by the way. You know, that's somebody you put in my. I wanted to know a little bit about this because I think you put this in mind and, and doing so many interviews with all the people that you were actually was in contact with and and it was it, it was awesome man i just really and that's mr cox yeah. saying hi mr cox master cox <laughs> i think i'm going to see him soon in uh in georgia in, in georgia yeah. yeah i'm going to see him soon in georgia very cool really well why don't him. you can you tell us about your you know your childhood and yeah. and and what it, what what it was like growing up all right, I'm I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. For those that don't know, Rio can be very violent, though. I don't have too much sub stories about my, you know, my my upbringing. I I grew up in a middle class. I had good education. I, you know, I never struggled too much with it. But it's impossible for you to be from Rio, and I'm not saying Brazil from Rio, and not be ready to defend yourself. 
because Rio has one thing, man. It's good and bad. Um, you can have this mansion right next door to a, what do we call favelas, which is slums, the projects right here, right next door. And they, and they really, you know, live with each other pretty well. So you have a very wealthy neighborhood and a very poor neighborhood right next door to it. And this mix, which is a beautiful mix because you don't grow up judging too much. You always go up in it with a, with this integration from, from, from races, from, you know, from religions, from all those things. You, there's, it's, a, it's a big mix. So you don't separate that too much. But at the same time, you got to be ready to fight because the, the, the buttons are going to be, you know, pushed. You're going to be tested. That's 100%. I start judo with four years old. But a lot of people don't know. I start judo first, and I moved into taekwondo when I was like 12 years old. And I really could kick to save my life, man. I could I could have passed a kick <laughs> over a knee. So I, that could have was definitely, you know, the martial arts for me. And from there, I started doing boxing. Some of my friends doing boxing. This is 12, 13. When I was 14, 15 years old, I started jiu-jitsu. And I got invited by the, the uncle of my first girlfriend. I went to a barbecue in her house for the first time, and her uncle was a black belt from Carlson Gracie. Invite me to to be part of Carlson Gracie. He saw me, you know, short, stark. He said, "Hey, man, you should have started doing training jujitsu." And and I went there. This is was a Sunday, Monday. I went there, and I never stopped. You know, from there on. Wow. Yeah, in which a lot of people don't know. I live in a neighborhood called Umaita. And for those that know a little bit of jujitsu, I live exactly six minutes walking from the Gracie Umaita, which is Helio Gracie was and, and Hoyler Grace and Hicks and Grace and all those big names. It was six minutes from my house walking. Wow. But, but I end up in, in a different neighborhood to take a 40 minutes bus to get there, you know, in Copacabana to train with Carlson. Wow. I don't, but I don't regret it. Now, I'm just saying this is just really one of those coincidences that that people just invite in and you go and and I started training jujitsu and and I just just never stopped it man it was really something that was love at first sight and this is turning to lifestyle I was I was good at it there was something that you know when you belong right away right I just never was really good at basically anything I was good in judo but it was never really eh it was never my thing. So when I really went to jiu-jitsu with 15 years old, it was it was my sport. I was part of the group that was my sport. I was I really belonged to it, you know. And and what what, what do you remember about you know when you first started training? What was uh, you know having had a little bit of martial arts experience? Obviously, uh, you know the the culture of 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 every martial arts school and system and instructor is different. What, what was the culture like when you started training in jiu-jitsu? Completely different from everything. From judo, because I did judo from four to eight, nine years old. And after that, I spent the time not doing anything. And I started doing martial arts again with taekwondo when I was 11, 12, 12 years old. And the culture of taekwondo was completely different than, than jiu-jitsu. Um, you know, I was I was taught by Master Kin that was a Korean, uh, Korean master in Rio. It's one of the pretty well known guys who lived nearby our house. So it was extremely traditional, and and it's even closer that it was from my house. I was a kid, so I was walking there and, and coming back. I could never, maybe because you know, I don't know body type or culturally, I could never fit in. In a jiu-jitsu, maybe because of my grappling experience with judo, it was something that was right away. It was right away. And the Brazilian culture and the jiu-jitsu is very much, you know, mold into the Brazilian culture. And um, it's, it's very welcoming in a way. You know, you fall in and, you, you you know, you just walk in and you just present yourself. you got to be respectful. You got They get all this. You know, this good tips on how to survive inside there, especially at that time. It was less organized. 
um, I fall in into an extremely competitive uh, school, which is Carlson Gracie team. And Carlson Gracie team at the time had have two uh, two rooms. Is it three hundred two and three hundred one? And when I get there, three hundred one, you have to be invited. So you cannot. You are white belt. You don't walk in the three hundred one. It's like be throw it to the sharks. You have to have some experience in the three hundred two, which a, a lot of even higher bank, you know, higher ranking belts were going over there, so they can get accustomed to the training or really get some stamina to go train in the 301. Even a black belt who just jump in the 301, he will be murdered because that was the competition team. It's a different level, completely different level. But I I got I I started training and this like I said I was really I, I dove into this and I was completely uh, driven to to go to 301. That was my best bad. I mean, I gotta go there. I gotta go train with those guys. All those those high level guys are coming in, and I, man, I trained my butt off. Three months in, I was invited for the first time to actually be part of the, to to go train with the guys. But three months in, I competed in my first tournament. You know, it was the what the, we call the novices, the guys that never competed before, right. and and I won, and. At this point right now, I, I made friends with a guy called De La Riva. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Ricardo De La Riva is, is, a, is a very good competitor from Carlson Gracie, and he actually created uh, a particular guard. It's a position that everybody knows as De La Riva guard, and it's pretty famous in the jiu-jitsu. But I was a very good friends with him. We kind of, from there, we grew up together, you know, with – He's a little bit older than me, two years or three years, but we kind of grew up from there. And and he ended up, uh, I ended up introducing him to his girlfriend, who ended up being his wife. So we always, we always together. We all went together, and and we built up this core group of guys that was training. And at this point, right now, Carlson Gracie has absolutely the best team, Jason, that there was in Brazil. There was nobody. Nobody's getting – they're always fighting for the second place. You know, first place it was always Carson Gracie by an enormous advantage of points there. You know, he has all the teams and guys are winning category by category, by weight division, by by, rail, by belt system, by belt ranking. So he was absolutely the best coach with the best academy, the most competitive. And, and I grew up in that environment, you know, like it or not. A lot of crazy things, you know, that you see it. It's a lot of it's a lot of stupidity that we see it. There was four hours training, three hours training is just uh, what I compare a lot was to this at the point. You know, at Carson Gracie Gym at that time, you, you compare this as as you put a bunch of beans in a hand right here and you shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, and the beans that stay are the champions, you know. So it was completely craziness, man. There was a lot of training, a lot of what we call pojada, you know. And it was it was tough, but it was it was very very rich. <laughs> oh, Master Talks, you're the man. You know that. Oh, tell me a man. little bit. Tell me a little bit about um, you know at, at fifteen sixteen. Uh, obviously, you, you're still at, at a school age. Were there other activities or other things that you did? Uh, as a teenager, as a young child, um, other than jujitsu, other sports, other activities, I, I compete. I compete in judo. I compete in wrestling. Um, at that age, you know, that was. I was a state champion in wrestling. I was a state champion in judo. I, you know, more with a jujitsu base than anything else. I think in judo itself, I had my background in judo in the beginning, but I was never good enough or trained me or trained enough in judo. When I got a little bit older, I decided to start a training judo for a competition. So I went to one of the best clubs there in Brazil, which a lot of people train, was Flamengo. And I really started learning more judo and competing for, for, for judo. So judo and wrestling definitely was the two other sports that I was competing in that teenage years, you know. Right. From there was just jujitsu. After that was it was just jujitsu. 
and, and, and those really go hand in hand uh, with jujitsu uh, as you transition into uh, some of your competition later. So, you know, again, talk, talk a little bit about uh, Carlson Gracie and what, what it was like uh, to train with him. And, and um, you know, we always in, in martial arts, I think we always kind of sit back and talk about the glory years, about you know how hard the training was and our training. You know, everybody's training was harder yeah. than somebody else's training. Um, you know, give us a little bit more insight as to what it was like, what, what the classes were like in uh, your sessions. Yeah. With him. So this is interesting even to say. Carlson was, um, he was a mentor. He was, a, you talk about a master, master really. Um, he, he was a mentor. He was one of those guys that when he walks in a room, everybody stops. You know, if you're training jujitsu, everybody stops or everybody goes crazy. You know, you know, they go crazy. It's almost like a wave coming to the room. You know, if the guy goes to the door there, even if he doesn't, if he doesn't let anybody see it, he walk at the door and you start from the guys that are close by and they started killing each other and end up down there in the room because feel like a wave. Feel like, man, Carson is in the room. Come on. You got to show, <laughs> you got to show that, you know, what, you, what you're there for. And people are just going crazy there's so so many some of the best trainings that i have seen it in my life was actually the qualifiers for the tournaments that people go hand to hand and you have to get the guy on the best in the best condition on the weight division on that particular belt and those guys go crazy and usually usually the winner of the qualifier inside of carlson gracie gym it used to be the winner of the tournament that was going to be competing uh, the two weeks later. So they always have the qualifiers to see who is the best. So you see some of the best guys at Carlson, you know, going toe to toe really, really hard, you know, to try to get the spot. Really amazing training is amazing atmosphere. And you part of this and he was really, he was a mentor in essence. First of all, he was extremely competitive. Jason. Very competitive. He he didn't even like to lose on I don't know cards or whatever <laughs> it is now. You know, rock paper scissors. He yeah. don't like to lose. Period. And he really installed this in people. It's sometimes he used to take one guy here that he feels like he's growing up. You know, he started getting momentum and get in line up with the best guys, even in the different rankings, just to just to test it. You know how this guy is. How many times that he did that a tough guy coming in to train with a team, right? The first time, and the guy who wants to do a a quantum leap, leap, you know, just try to go and jump a, a next level, and, and he decides to roll the team and says, "Oh, Olaboro, come here, come here," and you just train with that guy here, see how it goes. And we got wars with guys that come from the street. You know, just because he was like, come on, you, know, you want to try? You want to do a test? Okay. Or Morello, Bustamante, come over here. Or Laborio, come over here. Come on, those guys here. Just go, go check out how it is. And there was a war, <laughs> you know. He always testing those guys from the outside and all mess. So there are always stories like this. And you go for competition. And he, he, he was able to... He was able to install this confidence that you can. He believes in in us more sometimes than you believe in yourself. You know, one of those things that the guy really at the place. No, you're gonna win. You're gonna do this, 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 and that, and you're gonna win. You're gonna beat this guy. I know. Just believe what I'm saying. Go there, and and you go there, and you do it, and you win. You know, he got this key master eye that what he could say it from position to position. And if you just follow the script, man, you win. It was, it, I don't know, man. It, it was a, something that's special, you know, yeah. something very special. He was able to build a team. And it was the first guy to really actually transition from, from jiu-jitsu with a gi to the best team in MMA. You know, all those guys, they say, okay, now we're going to compete in MMA. Yeah. And, and it's something interesting because – this the MMA thing. So a lot of people don't know about this, but in 1991, 
in Brazil, there was a big rivalry in between two styles, jiu-jitsu and luta livre, which was growing a lot in Rio de Janeiro. The luta livre guys coming from wrestling, uh, lucha livre is just a kind of style of wrestling. Right now they change the name for wrestling, but but before it was lucha livre in a lot of Latin countries. So a lot of the luta livre guys came from this background of a nogi, and they're really growing a lot. And at one point there was is there was a, a I think there was some sort of a argument in between Walid Ismail that challenged some guys online. I don't know. No, he's online on TV. And end up with the Luta Lever guys came to one of the jiu-jitsu places to challenge the jiu-jitsu guys. And Carlson, which at the place, we, you know, they all sit down together. And those guys really actually uh, got in a court to do an event. So it was going to be jiu-jitsu against Luta Livre. And the best guys in jiu-jitsu against the best guys in Luta Livre. So they pick up some of the jiu-jitsu best black belts at the time. It was uh, Murillo Bustamante, Gorgel, Amori Bitachi, um, Walid Ismail. There was, a, there was a bunch of guys right there. And, and those guys competed in the first volley tudo jiu-jitsu against luta livre what nobody knew is that they put this event live on prime time tv with the biggest tv channel there was and this is was crazy because right after the event which was live and people but had blood all over imagine this is in 1991 1991 and this it was, was all right this was all before before the UFC. Before. Yeah, way before. It, it was two years before UFC. Just for yeah. you to understand the importance of the 1991 event, which is Jiu-Jitsu against Toyota Livre. But at the same time, this is went to a, a great line story in the newspapers in the next day when everybody was talking about this conflict between Jiu-Jitsu and Luta Livre. And all the guys at Jiu-Jitsu beat the Luta Livre guys, right? And what happened from that is, all the media came talking so bad, human, human cockfighting. You know, this is a this is crazy. This is savage. It's because all animals, blah blah blah. But after this, every teenager in the country, millions of people, wanted to do jujitsu. Two years later, 1993, UFC was created. It was in base of the clash of the styles. In between jiu-jitsu and, and other styles or other styles against other styles and you see the importance in 1991 for the 1993 but at this point right now in 1991 all those jiu-jitsu guys were trained by carlson gracie and this is was the first time that jiu-jitsu got united against the luta livre guys by by the head coach of carlson gracie and they won everything it was exceptional. It was really, really good for jujitsu in a way and bad in other ways because the live TV really came out with the bad media. But it created that shock of a style, which it turns into UFC. Which it turns into what are we saying today? Before it was Valetudo. And after that, turns into No Holds Bar. And after that, turns into MMA. You know, so this progression. I was able to see all this, you know, I follow up all this, but haven't seen my guys fighting and living that in the backstage. It was, it was a lot. Yeah. Well, talk about, talk about some of your competitions. You, you, you mentioned, you know, after three months of training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you, you did your first tournament, but you went on to have great success in tournaments and, and beyond. Talk a little bit about your competitions. I compete a lot. I competed a lot in Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. I spent a long time to people talking about, um, you know, from ranking belts from, from blue belt. I, I stayed in blue belt for five years, four to five years, which is a lot of time comparing with a regular blue belt. But at the same time, you, for you to, for you to be promoted, you know, at the Carlson Grace team, that means that I have to have a, a white belt good enough to be in my place in a blue belt. The purple belt has to go to brown. The brown has to go to black. 
so we can all fit in and we would jump all together. Otherwise, he does not move in anybody, so they can keep winning on the category. <laughs> it was the invention of the sandbagging, but that's true. <laughs> that's pure true on this. And and I competed a lot in blue belt, competed a lot of purple belt, brown belt, black belt, black belt also. But I was into a point I was going to school, I was going to business, uh, business school, and I was I was working. I work in a bank, the Bank of Brazil, which is it's pretty pretty well known bank there, which is a state government owned uh, company. So I was working for the government in a bank, and I was having a solid this solid you know job, but I hate it. I hate it. I was working in a bank. I was a manager. I was working with a suit and a tie every day, but it's something that I really did not like it. My life and heart it was in the sport. And it got into a point that, that I have to make the chance. I really was not happy at all. So with 27 years old, I said, man, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't work in a bank. As solid as it is, as stable as it is, I, I decided to, to believe in myself, and, 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 and I made this jump everybody thought i was crazy are you going to be doing what you're leaving this job to work with martial arts with jiu-jitsu you know you don't forget this jiu-jitsu wasn't famous at the time jiu-jitsu was small you know jiu-jitsu was small mma was small really really small compared with everything nobody believing in and nobody believing in what i was doing you know i mean this is and this is a common story when you talk to almost any martial artists at, at one point, you know, people, people must have told them that they were crazy to open a martial arts school or uh, the, the old saying how, you know, when are you going to get a real job is what a lot of people would hear so often. Um, you know, we've all kind of, we've all kind of been there, but so you took this, you took this leap of faith and you left the bank yeah. and you, and you started teaching yeah. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. From there on, you know, from there on, we went, um, <clears throat> We went from Carlson Gracie to Brazilian top team, and we built up the best teams in the world. And after that, American top team, one of the best teams in the world. And it really, it got to a point that, you know, to be honest, MMA really was not my environment. I think I think BJJ is way more. I'm a more martial artist guy. I'm a martial artist. You know, I think it's important this 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 perception of uh, of the martial arts and, and the base of respect. It goes along with what do we try to accomplish. And it, for me as a lifestyle, I, I'm not just there for the for the trophies and the awards. Although I competed a lot, I was part of the team, there was competition as part of this. I was there for, for happiness, you know? It's, it's, it's way more, it's just way more than anything. It's, it's, way, more, it's Tom- way more than therapy, this is important. Tell me a little bit about the formation of Brazilian Top Team and how, how did that come to be? And, and then when did you come to the United States and, and create American Top Team? So Brazilian Top Team was a spinoff of the Carlson Gracie team for some, for some other reasons there. You know, Carlson, the guys think that Carlson wasn't happy with some um, of the contracts that Carlson was put into it. And, and I was not one of the guys. I worked in a bank, so I would not – fighting MMA or Valetudo, I was by contract. I cannot get involved. If you remember, Valetudo at the time was really a bad rap, and I was a manager in a bank, so I could not do it, anything like that. And I have a very, you know, very condition of working with the bank and, and training. <clears throat> so in the one point, uh, the guys decides to go out. Yeah, I end up going with the guys too. He kicked some of the guys there, which is the leadership, I was involved with that. And from that, Brazilian Top Team was created. Brazilian Top Team already was born with a lot of great names of the Valley Tudo at the time. There's this event in Japan called Pride. Uh-huh. And so we have some of the best names there, like like Ricardo Arona, like Victor Belfort, like Nogueira, uh, the, the Nogueira brothers, Big Nog, Little Nog. Uh, Carlos Barreto, uh, Marilo Bustamante, Maris Perry. There, there was a bunch of big names that were there competing. 
and and much more. So this is especially in Japan. This is was a tremendous name. It was in a way was was the time that everybody's competing, and there was this big rivalry against in Brazil against BTT and Shootbox, which was a lot of great fights came in from that, you know. And I received a a invitation to to come to America and to start training the guys in America. And I had an idea down there to actually take the top teams and started creating other top teams around the world. You know, it wasn't very accepted in the Brazilian top team guys, but in the end, I sold my part of Brazilian top team. You know, I got the name of American top team and we created American top team for the owners, you know, and, and that's it, you know, for, for basically a lot of, a lot of sweat, blood and tears, you know, they got what it was. Well, I, I remember, um, you know, being one of the first schools, where, where right. you started branching out and, and, and then you started licensing schools. And that's, yeah. you know, that's how we first met is becoming yeah. one of the one of the first. I think we were one of the first three licensed yep. schools um, in American Top Team. And that, that was a great time because you had a, a great curriculum put together. Um, again, it's where, where I had a chance to train, you know, one on one with fighters. you. Uh, that, that, that was that was awesome. That was a, a really great experience. Um you you moved away from that, and it, during all of this time, though, you've you've had some you know obvious experience as a, as a coach uh, in the UFC, and you've had many of your fighters fight in the UFC. Talk about some of the fighters that you've worked with, and 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 you know some of your memories of oh, coaching in the UFC. There were so many, um, <laughs> there were so many, and um, let, let's say. Um, Robbie Lawler, Tyron Woodley, Hector Lombard. Um, there are so many there. You know, some some standout guys there. There's uh, <laughs> there's so many guys that we went there. And at one point there, Jason, this is was really it. It was it was a lot because you you got in a circuit. The circuit with UFC started getting more and more events. and got bigger and bigger. And, and they, sometimes they have more than events, you know, in the weekend. Now, you it usually is like this. You leave your house on Wednesday. You got that on Thursday and it helped the fighter too. Or even if it's Wednesday, Thursday, you cut the weight. Friday, you weigh in. Saturday you fight and Sunday you come back home. You know this is was for my for many years, decades. This is was my life. You know, working every weekend. How many birthdays and how many events that I really actually lost it because of that. It was it it, it, it gets old at one point. You travel a lot. You see it a lot. I have lived a lot of this. I think is worth it. Ex experience was really important but for me it was like man i you know i, I really I really couldn't do this anymore you know for me it was it's, really it's it's for the family and everything is you know it's you got to make an option you got to you got to have an option of 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 investing that and invest in a family i was heavily invested on this thing here and at one point but that um yeah it's it just, it just gets old i, I yeah, like yeah it. it's a and grind like right it. Yeah, I, I I like being home. You know, I yeah. like to enjoy the family life. I like to. I, I love being around my my kids. You know, it's something yeah. that I really that was really missing it too. So from that, I moved there. I moved to Orlando, and I started working with the University of Central Florida. So we we create a I think it was the first jujitsu academic class. Um, with the Department of Kinesiology in the state of Florida, at least, you know, at least in the state of Florida. And this is something that it, it grew a lot, working with university. Now we end up from from one class, we, you know, because before, before COVID, we were already doing almost like five classes and we had a club there with 390 people. It was, it was pretty cool. And still, wow. you know. It was really, really cool to see how much this has grew there, you know, the university. Now, now, how did that? How did that come about? How did that program? How did that? 
you know, how did you get started doing that? In reality was this. I, when I got out of American Top Team, I knew that the licensees itself is the way to go to make money. But I need to offer a little bit more. And it goes into the business side. You have to, for a lot of brands right now, it's, it's just the logo. You offer the logo and the guy uses your logo and open a gym. But this is, doesn't mean success. It means reputation. It means credibility. But it doesn't mean success. The business part of it, and you know beyond anybody else that you have to have your systems in place. You have to have the marketing, the sales, your instructors development. You have to have this retention tools. And I started to develop a little bit this with with the guys that helped me, you know, Robbie Beard and 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 Michael Madsker, guys that really actually helped my whole life there on it. And and I started looking for help. And I, I live nearby UCF, University of Central Florida. So I have a person there, which was one of them, end up being the head guy for the Department of Kinesiology. So uh, Dr. Fukuda, Dr. David Fukuda does jujitsu and, and judo. So when he, when he was there and he looked at, I was looking to try to find out kids that are interested in the work with the, with the brand that I have, in, which is Martial Arts Nation. And he says, Oh, why don't you, why don't you just start teaching a class here with me? You know, and I, and I thought it was super interesting. I was very interested in, in to see the approach that he had there. And they have a judo class, which is an academic course with three credits inside the kinesiology department. And I said, man, this is a great thing. You know, jujitsu never had this kind of credibility ever. And, you know, we sit down together and we put together the curriculum and, and we created this course that actually a class you know, a three credit course class in University of Central Florida that you can go there and you can study jujitsu, you know, and, and other levels. And this has grew into four, four classes and hundreds of students. And I'm, man, I'm happy as it can be. <laughs> you know, I'm really happy. I'm really happy. And, and now, we can do it our way, you know. Did now, now, you just recently opened a new facility, correct? Yes, but that's we didn't grant opening yet. We just opened up because I really wanted to to do some research on teaching the kids. That's something that I really wanted to do it. Um, before with the schedule that I have it, you know, traveling like you know, like I used to do it, it was, it was really hard for me to do so. So I talked to a partner that I have, and I say, guys, just take a let me learn how to teach kids. And I went from research. A lot, you know, how to really develop a character education program, you know, something that can be that can be utilized with jujitsu because jujitsu can be boring, Jason. You know how it is. You know, you got to mix up a lot of, of this, you know, but everything from the from all the elements of martial arts to try to make it interesting. Yeah. Um, a lot of the takedowns, a lot of the ground. It's, there's levels of doing this, and how to teach the kids, especially young ones. It's something that I really, I was really interested in doing it, but I have to do my research to do it. So mm -hmm. we we open up a facility inside of another facility, and it's doing pretty well. We already have some. We got a good kids class, which I'm really concentrating, and and I leave the adults there from from the guys in university. You know, but it really is. It's a kids. It's a kids program. Let's put it this way, which is something that I really. I really have a lot of joy in doing that right now. Yeah. You know, I really am. I really, I really have a lot of fun. You great. can see the immediate return on, on personality. You know, oh, yeah. you know that you're helping it. It's, 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 it's just amazing. You know. Yeah. But I'm I still, I still a blue belt on it. You know, I'm still developing. Yeah. And 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 I keep it on research. Yeah. I always gonna be. I'm gonna knock at your doors to get some, some knowledge. You know. <laughs> Any Anytime we're here yeah. for each other, right? Tell tell me a little bit more about about Martial Arts Nation and and what what is the uh, what is your vision for th this new branch of of your development? Um, first of all, I think there is is a chance for for Jiu Jitsu to grow as a 
as a sport, but as a as a tool, much more in, <clears throat> in personal development than anything else. Everybody knows the efficiency of the sport. You know, it's proved from from MMA or volleyball or to jujitsu competitions itself. But the sport, when it came to U.S. or even right now, it's still not really well formatted, so they can fit in into the school system, for example. You know, something has to be done to be implemented. Way more tools on the character education side, on on the anti bullying programs. There's something that there's something that the traditional martial arts are 50 years. I'm telling you this. A kid, you're not. I, I say that since 1970s, the traditional martial arts have been developed programs that fit in for kids and 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 the build up, the formation of the character of the families itself and communities through karate, to taekwondo, to traditional martial arts, and jujitsu is way behind in the ball on that. I think there is a way to to bring this to the jujitsu community um, and and show the benefits of doing this. You not just benefit yourself as a instructor or a school owner, but it benefits your community. You know, you, you not just to give orientation, you give all the tools, but also you solve problems for the kids. So we're here right now, and I have one of my, my oldest school in Norway, for example, um, and Eduardo Rios. He has the most, the most reputable, the most successful martial arts school in Norway, in Oslo. Somebody comes to visit, go see him. It's called Frontline Academy. So Frontline Academy in Norway is really the biggest brand. And he is the best coach by far, you know, in the whole Norway. So right now, oh, Sergio. Yes, for sure. Carlson, Carlson and Sergio. That's it, Mr. Cox, for sure. Um, I'm going to talk to them this next week. So I'm here in Norway, and I was invited to do a seminar inside the school system here. That's exactly what we're talking about. So they're really trying to get this to a different level. And it's not about the technique. It really is not. It really is about the, the character education programs, you know, and how to do the match hats and how to develop better structures, how to not make it boring. And you know? all this, that, that traditional martial arts have it for such a long time, and, and jujitsu don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that if you try, if you, if you ask me the, the, the why behind martial arts nation, I think is this, you know, is giving the tools to, to jujitsu grappling MMA schools to be more successful through this, you know, to understand the why, you know, everybody is so concentrated right now and, and, and the next champion and the next UFC champion, and which is, being done, been there, done that, you know, I, I know the rewards, the like it or not, but I feel like the impact has had to be in this generation of of new instructors, school owners, and and kids. It's, it's changing kids' lives. That's what it is. That's what it rewards me. That's what it, this is my passion. This is what it makes me um, keep doing, you know, what I do. You know, I, well, I have for for quite years I have done for the for the champions and for the right. trophies and but not anymore, not anymore. You know. Well, there's you know there's a um, it's it's like we say our our legacy of teaching martial arts it's it's what we have to give and what we have to offer our students to help them grow because once they're able to grow now they can be potentially a better instructor, better martial artist, better. Uh, role model example in their community and uh, the more that we do this in our martial arts schools it does it does elevate everything uh, you know whether it whether it's jujitsu or whether it's tong sudo or krav maga or whatever whatever the style or the system is you know it's it's that effect that we have on the person overall because i think that there's there's only so many techniques that we can teach really and there and yeah. and you can get so good at those techniques and you can memorize a million different techniques but what about all the lessons that it took to learn all those techniques or how many times they had to fail to get to that next level or 
you know, just being humble enough to know that there's more out there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's just so much to the martial arts that sometimes people don't see because yeah. they're so focused on, like you said, focused on the championships yeah. or they're focused on the belts or the, the rank or yeah. whatever it is. But like, you know, you've been doing it a lot longer than I have, yeah. but you've seen the effect that even with your own fighters and people that you've trained, what they've taken from their championships or from their training yeah. into their life or into their career yeah. and how they raise their family. Correct. And, so, and it, Master Flame, you know that being a parent, it does not come with a manual, neither. You know, a lot of those values are the same values that a good parenthood should have to actually explain in a comprehensive way, verbal way, to their kids through examples, through words, through actions. And the parents, man, there's just. <laughs> I've been seeing this, and I I can say that studying all those those character educations and and skills development, I can say that I'm a better parent because of that, you know. And there's a lot of parents that are looking into this in martial arts, just because they they don't have the the, the skills. Right. They don't have the skills. It's not because they're bad people. No, it's because you were not raised that way or in certain ways. This and and. You know how it is. If you teach your kid in a certain way, you're teaching also your grandkids. Right. That's what it is. And yeah. it goes down to re-education. This is, goes down to knowing what to say and giving a good example and try to be the example. So th this is what I, this is what, this was my passion is right now. You know, yeah. and I'm still, <laughs> and again, I'm still a blue belt. I'm still trying and I'm still learning and I'm very open to that. And 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 I think that my experience and pursuing the belts and the trophies and the medals, all this being competitor, being you know part of this big team, all this was excellent to create credibility. But it's not enough for the main the main goal for the martial arts, which is the happiness. Man, that martial arts for me is happiness. Martial arts for me is life. is a lifestyle. It's not just, you know, is is just one more notch on a, you know, one more trophy on a. It's it's really about overcoming, especially overcoming. Absolutely. Because things are gonna happen, and 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 more and more I practice this. More and more I see this. More and more I'm I'm passionate about this. You know, and and. I, one thing I know, you know, from down there, from from quitting a, a very stable, good job is making real money. I don't think I would ever be happy. I think if I'm happy right now, I'm happy right now because I do what I love. I do. I'm one of the guys that do what is love. It's not always going to be happy with the money. It's always going to be happy. It's just always good. Things are always going to happen. Problems are always going to show up. But I'm going to die doing this, man. I see it. I'm going to be nine years old, 100 years old, having a heart attack inside the match. I hope not. But that, oh. that's really, really what I would, if there's a way to go, it would be, it would be inside the match, man. This is what people work so long to get a retirement plan and try to do something that you love it, try to find out something that you love it later. For us, it's what do we love to do, you know? And we try to keep trying to make it the money and everything else, which is which is part of the game, right? Too. Yes. But it's that's well, it. we are we are that's we it. are lucky to to do what we yeah. love. I, I have always I, I remind myself yeah. that very often how fortunate yeah. I am to be able to, you know, teach martial arts, which is what I fell in love with you know, yep. many years ago, and I, I still get to do it. You know, a lot of people ask me about my experience in this or experience in that. And I said, well, you know, honestly, I've, I've only ever owned a martial arts school. Through that, I have had many opportunities, yep. you know, come about, uh, which is really, really interesting, because I always go back to the martial arts is what presented yeah. the opportunity to be a consultant, to have a podcast, to get into professional wrestling. I mean, that all happened yep. because yep. of 
passion for martial passion. arts. Your Yeah. So yeah. this is this is life, Jason. It doesn't come with the problems. The problems will be there in the different areas and different ways. But but knowing that you love what you do, like I know I do love what I do. That's that's my best, man. I mean, what I'm teaching, what I'm with my kids, or I'm with my with my community right there. This is what I really feel like I am. You know, this is how I like. Wow, man, this is this is awesome. You know, and. Well. And that's it. That's, that's basically we're 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 retired or not. <laughs> we're going to do this <laughs> rest of our lives, you know. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, what what would you what would you do if you if if you won the lottery and won you know endless amounts of money? You'd still do it, right? I mean, that's that's always a question. What what if you what if you won the lottery? What if you had all the money in the world? I would still teach martial same arts because thing. I love it. <laughs> we build we build thing. bigger gyms. Yeah. Or or <laughs> hire people that to do things that you don't like to do it, you know, right. in terms of uh, the business side or, but that's, that would be doing the same thing, man. Yeah. I would. That's your yeah. claim. I, I love that. That I know, you know, again, it doesn't come with, you know, with zero problems. There's always going to have conflict. You're always going to have, you just overcome them. Like the discipline in martial arts show that you have to show up every day and you just have to suck it up. You just got to, then up and you just take your well, losses like, and you're learning and it's kind of like grappling with you you know you just have to weather the storm <laughs> and, and hope you make it out alive oh my god i'm just so old <laughs> i'll right never now. forget it <laughs> hey uh well you know listen we're almost almost at an hour yep. um today and and you know i i appreciate all the stories and just sharing your experience with us and and i love your passion uh, it, it's it is truly inspiring to know someone that's been doing this a heck of a lot longer than I have and still have that same excitement, that same smile, that same oh, energy and love you. for doing it. Uh, so uh, I, keep that going. I, I can't wait to see what else you do next. Can, I love can what you, you're doing. I love what you're doing. Let me just tell you this right now. You're just, you inspire us all too, Jason. You know, what you're doing, your passion for martial arts, this podcast, you know, your knowledge from the industry itself, your, your personality, I can say that I'm a fan. You know that. I'm here right now because uh, of that. Thank you. I really <laughs> you know appreciate that. it. I appreciate it. I, I definitely, again, I appreciate your time and, and everything. Can you can you close out the show and just, um, if, if you're talking to everybody that's watching right now, and um, what, what advice would you give them if they're faced with a challenge right now or they're, they're, they're struggling to take that next step? Well, for, for the next step, it all depends what it is, but for the next step is my next step, it came with a lot of with a lot of struggle because I came from I came from a very secure, stable job to go to believe in something that I only I believe it. I was the only person, especially in my family. Nobody could understand at all. I just I just really had this big lip of faith in myself, believing that if I am a kind of person that uh, I'm, I'm successful being a good friend, I'm successful being a good family man, I'm successful being a good employee, I'm successful being a good athlete, I'm successful being a, a good whatever, parent, or whatever it is. If you're successful in something, why don't you think you're going to be successful outside that. So for me, it was my leap of faith was believing in me. I said, man, I have a lot of success in my life. And even with my case, and I, I didn't like to work in a bank, but even with that, I'm a manager there. Why do I think I'm not going to be successful? I'm going to find a way. And I did. You know, I did. I remember when I called my mom the first time when I was there and I said, hey, mom, I'm buying my first house here and i was stopping the middle of the road and i was she was crying on the phone and she was always worried now you're going to be able to have your own place and i buying my first house working with martial arts and i was calling her you know and i believe that i made much more um than i would ever made working in a place that i would be miserable that's what happened there and i can say that you know whatever this is takes me from here right now i know that i did this as i know i did right because I love what I do, man. I really do, you know, and that's the special. 
because very few people can say like this. I, I love what they do. So I, I agree. I agree. Mr. Flame, thank you for having me. You thank and you all, so much. All your, you guys are, are awesome. You know that. You can count on me. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you soon, and, and we'll catch up. Uh, wishing you guys you know, great holidays and, and the best in the new year. I, I hope to really catch up soon. Okay. Take care, guys. Have a safe trip back. Thank, thank you, you, guys. And everybody have Bye -bye. a great week. We'll see you soon.